Welcome to the Cinnabar. Today we're at the oldest building left still standing here on the ranch, the old original blacksmith shop. It was built in the mid-1880s sometimes, and it's little changed both on the outside and the inside from what it was back at that time. Today we're going to talk about some of the crude repairs we see on some of these old vintage firearms. Repairs we often mistakenly attribute to everybody's favorite amateur gunsmith, Bubba. <laughs> We're going to take a look around in here and see what they actually had to work with back in those days. Way out here in these remote areas of the West, um, there wasn't any gunsmiths nearby to, to uh, send these guns out to. So they did the best they could just to get them operating again. So let's take a, a look around and uh, this might be a little educational. Well, in the 19th century, if your favorite old Winchester needed repair work, you didn't have a lot of really good options. Now, sure, you could box it up and, and send it um, on a freight team all the way back to Winchester factory, clear across the country. Probably going to be gone for several months, and you're going to be without your Winchester all that time. Or you could take it to a gunsmith, and of course, in this country, I'll bet you it was at least a three-day ride each way to somebody who was a dedicated gunsmith with the proper equipment and whatnot. But most gunsmithing was done by the blacksmiths. Um, they doubled from as gunsmiths, blacksmiths, and just about every kind of general fix-it repairman there was. And some of these more remote ranches out here had their own blacksmith shop like this one. So here's a picture of the ranch taken, oh, I'd say about 1890, maybe 1900. This is the building we're in right now, the old blacksmith shop here. It and the barn were built about 1887. Notice over here a freight wagon going by on the road. And we talked a little bit just about uh, sending our old Winchester by freight back to the factory. And that's, uh, that's the kind of wagon she'd have probably rode on back in the day. Now if we did take, choose to, to freight this, our old Winchester out of this area, would have gone through the, the Hotel Shuaquan. The, the hotel was owned by the same folks that uh, Homestead had owned the ranch here, and all the freight came in and out of the, the hotel. So here's the old guest register and ledger out of the hotel. I found it in an old chicken house here on the ranch, believe it or not. And you'll notice some of the entries there's for packages, and then some here for fare. So we know that the stage stopped in there at the, at the hotel. That was kind of the central hub for business in this area. I sure wish that uh, some of these packages said where they were going. It would be awfully interesting to see one address going out to Winchester with a rifle on it from one of the local families and try to track that rifle down now. The box that this thing's sitting on right now as I show it to you is actually an old Winchester ammo box that has a uh, shipping tag addressed to the Shuacan Hotel. Well, excuse the background noise, we had to fire up a generator to get some lighting in here. Now, if we were going to work on a, a firearm in the 19th century, odds are it'd be in a shop that looks something like this. As we pan around here, we can kind of see that this is pretty much unchanged from what it would have looked like back in the late 1800s. Um, we can see a lot of the old tools are still here, and, and there in the middle there's a, a tin of uh, calcium carbide, which they used in the miner's headlamps up at the Cinnabar mine. There's actually some steel flasks in here that they, they carried the mercury in as well. As we pan around here, we see over in the corner, which is really the, uh, the cornerstone of this, this shop, the old original wooden forge. Now there, there are five forges on this ranch, but that's the old original dating from well back into the 1800s. Let's take a little closer look at that. So this old forge is the closest thing they had to a welder back in the 19th century. Well, it still has the old blower over here and it still op operates. It's not hooked up anymore, but she still pushes a fair amount of air. The forge itself, of course, was a, a wooden frame, had uh, kind of a sandy grit for insulation in here, several big rocks to hold the heat. Of course, the firebox here with a clinker breaker in the bottom of it. Um, Forge tools, tongs here, hardy tools, and a whole tray full of tongs and hardy tools over here. Um, you know, this forge basically is sitting here just the way it was when it was last used. In fact, you know, there's even some horseshoes lined up on here that, that they were probably working on. They're, they're kind of a little pony horseshoe. 
Um, they certainly didn't waste anything. Some of these shoes are awfully thin to be uh, trying to save. There's a old working horse shoe there with big lugs on it. Um, the uh, hardy tools, of course, there's, there's some round ones. There's some that uh, kind of have a, a style that could have forged an octagon barrel on, although probably you would have used a, uh, a big swage block. And there probably was one in here, but it, it's long gone now. We've got kind of a small swage block here that could have forged um, barrels with. And then something that was much more useful for actual gunsmithing and gun work in this appropriately you know, a Winchester Western ammo box is these soldering irons. Of course, soldering would have been far more um, precise than over here with your, your firearm or any parts in the forge itself. Um, so I'm sure this was used quite a little bit. As we progress a little bit further than um, when oxygen acetylene came along, we uh, had like this early oxygen acetylene torch and there was some, some old, old bottles in here although we've removed them now. This one I think is called a Presto Weld torch. <laughs> um, and then interestingly enough in this bucket right here there's a, uh, a old ladle and some old loading and casting block here for a 3856. So I'm assuming there was a 3856, whether that was a Winchester 86 or a large frame Lightning or maybe a, an old Marlin. Um, don't know, but you could just see as, as they finished up what they were forging over here, they still had some, some coals and uh, they go ahead and, and uh, cast a few bullets and load up some ammunition while they were at it. These things are pretty rusty and almost uh, froze up these days. And then, of course, later on, um, it was probably another 50 years after this was built before they actually had any electricity. And they, they actually did run electricity into this building at one time. And, and I see a welding outlet over there, although they must have welded outside because um, if you struck an arc in here, um, this old building would go up just lickety split. I would love to fire up this old forge. I mean, you can't believe how much I would love to fire it up, but I know this building wouldn't last any second. I might not make it to the door before the building just went poof. <laughs> so let's take a look at a few old firearms that have had some repairs done that were likely done in a shop just about like this, or maybe even this very shop. First off, we've got an old heavy, heavy uh, muzzle-loading shotgun here. It's had a, a uh, broken stock at one time right here in the wrist and repaired. Now we see a lot of broken stocks back in um, these old vintage firearms and a lot of them were out here in the west we attribute to uh, problems on horseback where we had carrying rifles and, and horse rolled on them or whatnot. Although it's doubtful this, this big old muzzle loading shotgun was ever carried much on horseback. But they didn't have acroglass, they didn't have epoxy back in the day. They did have some good glues but they weren't waterproof so they didn't work very good for firearms repair. Now we do see a lot of them that are repaired with, with a rawhide wrap, especially among the Indian guns. And rawhide works really well because it, it tightens up and constricts as it dries and, and, and does make a, a good repair, although it does make like the wrist here would be much, much thicker. Now here we see a, a repair to this old shotgun that was done pretty well and it's pretty common where you see metal straps and there's actually three of them, two on this side and one on the other. Um, where they've gone across the crack here, and, th and this one was broke really badly. Um, and this one, they actually took the time to inlet this strap into the wood here, so that really it fits the hand really well, and you don't even really uh, feel that there has been a repair there. So they really took their time and, and did, did a pretty good job on, on this repair. And we've got this Davenport single shot shotgun. It's had a, a cracked wrist as well. Now this single shot Davenport shotgun has a little different kind of wrist repair. You can see it has a, a pretty fine wire really tightly wound around the wrist and then uh, tacked down here on the ends and on the other side as well. Um, really does a, a nice job. You can't really hardly even feel it's there. Um, really a, a nice repair. And we can almost be assured because of the type of wire that was used that this was a very old repair. 
Because in the early part of the 20th century, when these fancy new hay baling machines come along, everything started getting fixed up with one of the best fix-it materials of all time. You guessed it, hay wire. The duct tape of yesteryear. If you saw our episode on that junkyard 1894, you know that dovetail got soldered up to repair it, but it was still a little loose, so of course what'd they use? They just wrapped a little hay wire around it, tightened her right up. Then we've got a Springfield uh, second model Allen conversion, originally a Civil War musket converted to a, a trapdoor Springfield um, after the war. Most likely saw action out here in one of the local um, Indian War era forts that was, was in this area. It's had a, a repair around the, the breach here, around the chamber area. Now these second Allen conversion muskets are a really interesting old rifle. They were Civil War muskets converted to trapdoor. See, they milled out uh, the breech area here, installed these, these trapdoor mechanisms here, sleeved the barrels from 58 caliber to 50 caliber, and turned them into a 5070, which was kind of a precursor to the later 4570s. Um, this one, of course, had some issues. Um, the you can see that there's a screw missing here, probably it's stripped out. So they wrapped very tightly this cord around uh, the, the breech area um, over the top of the chamber. And uh, I'm assuming somebody maybe shot this one after they did that. I, I'd be a little hesitant, I think. Um, I've shot a 5070 second Allen conversion, and, and I gotta tell you, it was in a, a fun gun to shoot. I really enjoyed it. But I'd be a little hesitant maybe to shoot this one today. And last but not least, a, a little more modern 1894 carbine 2535 that uh, after we got oxygen and acetylene, it's had a tang broken off, most likely in a horse wreck, and uh, been brazed back on. Now here's this Winchester 94. Um, this would be a little later repair after oxygen acetylene arrived on the scene. We can see we've got the uh, tang brazed back on. We can see they, they didn't really get the crack filled on the bottom side here. But um, And then I found this cigar box full of carbine parts and here's a lower tang that um, obviously the back half of it or two thirds of it broke off as well. Almost assuredly this was from a horse rolling on it. There's just a lot of the guns out here in the West that uh, had this same kind of damage from being carried in the saddle. Now let's talk about the kind of man who would have done those kind of repairs. Who spent countless hours right here in front of this very forge. A man by the name of Will Courier. Now here's a picture of Will with his father Manley and his brother Manley Jr. Bub Courier. Manley was one of the very earliest settlers in Oregon and had a, a big land holding over in the Willamette Valley while um, Bub had a lot of holdings in this area along with uh, Will's holdings here on this ranch. Now later life, here's another picture of Will and several of his family members. Um, this is Will here in the middle, out in front of the Courier house, which is just down the road from where we're at now. This is the house that my wife, the Colt Collector, grew up in. Now Will and his wife Kate didn't have much when they came to this country. But what they did have is a legendary work ethic, even among the people who were all workaholics at that time out of necessity. Now, Will and Kate, through homesteading and their family's homesteading and buying out some of the adjacent homesteads, put this ranch together just on, on sheer hard work and determination. They ended up with the largest herd of horses in the county. And this is a huge county and a lot of horse breeders at the time. And to put it in perspective, the ZX Ranch, it's headquartered just down the road, is nearly 1.4 million acres. So the couriers did, did very well for themselves. They actually, um, later in life, when, when World War I broke out, they, they shipped thousands of horses out of here for the war effort, both back to the east, and then they bought a place down in California and, and shipped out of California. In fact, there's one story about uh, driving horses through Sacramento and, and they had a runaway right through the, the Capitol grounds in Sacramento. In fact, I'm told there's still a plaque down there commemorating the event. 
Um, in addition to the horses, they raised beef here, they raised hogs here, they had a smokehouse and a slaughterhouse here, um, because later on they, they ended up buying the hotel, and so they supplied the beef and the, and the pork for the hotel. They had a, a dairy up the hill that uh, as soon as their daughters were old enough to be able to ride, they would ride up every day and milk the cows, come back, make butter, um, supply the, all the dairy products and the meat to the uh, to the hotel and, and a lot of their neighbors around here. Um, really just a, a pretty amazing operation that, that went on right here. But their, their main focus was the horses. And, and this was a, a huge horse operation. Will had a lot of buckaroos to work for him. One of the stories goes about w Will's work ethic that uh, their, their desert headquarters out there at Lost Cabin, it's about a 15 mile ride out there, that Will and his buckaroos would be at Lost Cabin before it got light enough to see what color horse they were riding. So, you know, considering what people had to work with, it, it's just pretty amazing the, the things that were accomplished back in those days. And now as collectors, we tend to really covet and prize high condition firearms, um, totally original. But when we look around a place like this and think about uh, the firearms that maybe worked their way through this shop and the, the kind of men that, that made the repairs to them, I tell you, I'd be right proud to own a gun that I thought somebody like Will Courier or one of his men had repaired right here in this shop. Now, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I sure have. I, I kind of love the history of these kind of old things. So until next time, happy trails from the Cinnabar.